In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank You for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. But whoever causes one of these little ones who have believed in me to be trapped by child abuse, it would be better for him, that is the guilty one of child abuse, that a millstone, a millstone is of course what the uh, donkeys would uh, pull around. You've seen it in the old uh, movies. Uh, They would just uh, have a donkey pull the millstone and it'd go around in circles and uh, it would function in that manner. And that's what a millstone then is, a very heavy uh, piece of a wood, so that a millstone turned by a donkey were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the deepest part of the sea. That indicates that the greatest amount of judgment is allotted to those who commit child abuse. And we're in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. There are principles out of this, some of which we went over yesterday. And for the uh, child abuser, if you do not solve the problem immediately, you create new problems. Now, a child abuser could commit child abuse once. Usually they don't. Usually child abusers continue in their way and and do it over and over and over again. And there's really no way that they can stop themselves outside of post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation. And so what they do is perpetuate this child abuse And therefore, for themselves, they create new problems. And the time to solve the problem is when it occurs. So if a child abuser commits child abuse once, they should stop. And that is the indication from the verse. doesn't mean they will. As I've said, most people never do. Therefore, the child abuser becomes self-destructive. And they're not only destructive to the child, but they're destructive to themselves. And child abusers are the hardest to win for Christ. And if they believe, they're the hardest to win toward Bible doctrine. Now, the volition of the child, as we noted yesterday, the volition of the child cannot exceed the volition of the parents during the child's formative years. The formative years would be from ages uh, 1 to 12. After that, they move into the teenage years and they start making decisions on their own and they uh, finally start to break away from that uh, reliance on the uh, faith perception. But a, a, an, a, an abused child will break away from the faith perception at an earlier age because they have been uh, destroyed, as it were, by the abuser. Their soul has. Therefore, it is important that the parents uh, inculcate spiritual values in the children. And you can't leave it up to a church. You definitely can't leave it up to the school. It is up to the parent. And they are the ones who evangelize. They're the ones who should give the basic doctrines. And uh, in in most cases, especially here, I'm sure that's true. But in um, other cases around Christendom, a lot of people don't even uh, give the gospel to their children. They might not even know it. Or they don't even give basic doctrines. They leave it up to the church. They leave it up to Sunday school once every Sunday. And while Sunday school is legitimate, and uh, if we had children, we would uh, try to set up something like that where there would be Sunday school teachers, but... uh, Since we're so small, there's no need for it. But if there ever was a need, we would do that. But still, it is not the obligation of the church to teach children. It is the obligation of the parents. Since the parents have the greatest influence over their children, and they should, they always should. And so what the the parents do is they lead by example. And if the parents have made Bible doctrine number one in their life, then therefore the children see that, and that is a great influence on them. Now, it it doesn't always mean that the children will go positive and listen to the Word of God just as much as the parents. One example would be Solomon. Solomon uh, had a uh, a father who was a believer and a mature believer, King David. And King David taught him many things concerning doctrine. And uh, Solomon, uh, during his formative years, believed it and recalled it. Uh, But then when he got into his uh, adult life, 
he uh, strayed from those factors for many, many years. And his father would say, watch out for uh, women who just uh, freely give up of their bodies, etc. And uh, Solomon didn't do that. Uh, if a woman was willing to freely give up her body, and they all were uh, for King Solomon, you have to understand King Solomon was extraordinarily handsome. He would put Brad Pitt to shame. He would put any handsome person you've ever seen to shame. He was King Solomon, a very handsome, beautiful man. A man who had extreme wealth a man who would be very interesting and very attractive to the opposite sex. And so when these uh, women would tempt him, he would succumb to it immediately. And he had at least a, a thousand different concubines. There's no telling how many sexual relationships we, he had. There were many. And he even brings out the fact that uh, having all of those sexual relationships results in the destruction of the man's ability to perform sexually because uh, apparently... Uh, it doesn't say for sure, but apparently uh, at least David told him he could have been exposed to a sexually transmitted disease. And that is why it talks about in Proverbs the man losing his glory because um, what he was indicating is the man's glory would, would be in the sexual act and he had lost that ability. Now, whether it had been because he wore himself out or because... Uh, he got a disease, we just don't know. But David did talk to him about sexually transmitted diseases and said, uh, don't do this. And in fact, he may have even said, don't do as I have done. Have one wife for yourself and you'll be happy. And then we have a whole book in the Bible called the Song of Solomon, which deals with the fact that Solomon failed in so many ways concerning his sexual relationships with women that he never found his right woman. Oh, he found her, but she wasn't for him because... He had destroyed himself with so many sexual partners. And uh, we'll go over the Song of Solomon at some point. And uh, it's, a, it's a real eye-opener as to how uh, Solomon missed out on his right woman. And uh, the Shulamite woman is what she is called. And uh, she was a woman of integrity. And she held off, even though all the other women were mad for Solomon, she said, I'm not mad for Solomon. He just likes all the women. I am mad for that uh, country boy that I met. And it was a country boy. And um, he was too busy on the farm to uh, come see her in the city in which she lived. And so she waited on him. And while she was waiting on the uh, her, her husband, uh, or her future husband, uh, Solomon came along and noticed her great beauty. And he loved her brown skin because she was a farmer too. And he thought it was just beautiful that she was so tanned. Now back then, now today, every woman wants to be tanned. They go to tanning beds and all that. But back then, to be tanned was a sign of poverty. And that's because they worked out in the sun. And if you had a fair complexion because you weren't... <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Because you weren't out in the sun, if you had a fair complexion, you were considered wealthy and of nobility, and that would usually be what Solomon would go for. But he was struck by her beauty and her beautiful tan. And all the women were amazed at this Shulamite woman. And this uh, Shulamite woman was approached by Solomon. And she said, no way. And obviously she looked at all the women that he had and she said, there's no way this man's going to pay sole attention to me. Uh, sure, he's handsome. Sure, he's the wealthiest man on the earth. But uh, he's got all these women around him. He's not going to give me the attention that I deserve. And that was true. And she was smart. And she was a woman with doctrine. And so she said to herself, I'll wait on, my right, on the right man God had designed for her. Now, if Solomon had straightened out, uh, that would have been his wife. But he didn't straighten out. And she was very smart. And he writes a whole thing, Sol Song of Solomon, on how that um, depressed him. And even though he was the most wealthy man on earth with all the women in the world, he was depressed because he missed out on his right woman. And all those women did not make up for it. And he even writes about it. And he, and he writes about it very explicitly. And uh, in, in one case, he writes about uh, what's the worth of laying on this woman's breast when it's not the breast of my right woman. And that's how he described it. No comfort in it. She's just another floozy, in other words. But for his right woman, well, that would have been a wonderful thing for him. So that was part of his punishment, in that he did not listen to his father. And if he had listened to his father, he would have been all right. But later on in life, he got back with the Word of God. He finally came back to it and said, you know, my father was right. 
I've tried everything to be happy. And he had the greatest wealth in the world. Imagine being Bill Gates except a, a million times more handsome than Bill Gates with all that money. Well, you would say to yourself, I've got it made. But uh, King Solomon didn't look at it that way. And finally he said, I'm handsome. I have the greatest clothing in the world, the greatest money in the world, the most beautiful women in the world, but I'm still not happy. And he finally came to the point where he said, the only thing that will make me happy is doctrine. And he didn't do that until he was old. And that's where we get the famous verse in Proverbs where if a young man is raised in the right way, he will return to it when he is old. By that time, David couldn't rejoice over it. Uh, before then, he was probably kind of concerned about his son. Then he died, and uh, David didn't get to see that his son turned out all right. Not the best of fellows, but he turned out all right. Now, we're going to, uh, to study in detail child abuse. And the child in the example of 18.6, the child in view here is a believer. And the child in 18.6 is a believer. And children that are the victims of child abuse are sometimes believers. In fact, uh, nowadays, many of them are believers. They've already believed in Christ, and then they are abused by their abusing parents. And oddly enough, sometimes their parents are believers. And you say, how could someone sexually abuse a child and be a believer? Well, they believed in Christ. And it does happen. We have sin natures, and they definitely have a serious problem and are, go are going to go under serious judgment from the Supreme Court of Heaven. Abused children, however, who have not believed in Christ are often evangelized outside the home. And they are evangelized by other organization, organizations that are designed to help children. Sometimes they're evangelized by uh, the church. Sometimes they're evangelized by a very caring lady in a facility where they care for orphans or people who have been, been displaced because of their abusing family. So these organizations do take up the slack where family has failed. And the reason why we need so many of those organizations in this country is because the, the institution of family has failed miserably. And as a result of the failure of the institution of family, inevitably there will be divine discipline. As goes the family, so goes the nation. That's for any nation. And that has to do with civilization. All civilization is based on marriage and family, and if you have that falling apart, your country will eventually fall apart as well. So those who are victims of child abuse frequently become abusers themselves. If a young person has been abused sexually, usually they will act out sexually themselves. I've seen it many times in the field I worked in or heard about it, in which a, a young child would be sexually abused and then act out on it. And the parents would get confused. Why is this person, why is my child acting out sexually? They're only seven, eight years old. Why are they acting out sexually? In some cases, they uh, just do it. But in many cases, they're doing it because of abuse. And you might know, not know from whence it came. And it might be in the neighborhood. It might be in the school. It might be in the uh, people who take care of them while you're at work. But these are indications that if they act out sexually at a young age, there's been probably, there's probably been some abuse. Now, in some cases, children act out sexually anyway out of curiosity, and uh, as soon as they discover, well, that's just what happens. But uh, for uh, the, uh, in most cases, if they do it excessively, extensively, all the time, and sometimes doing it to the point in which they cause themselves to bleed, etc., that is definitely a case in which you need to check out and see uh, if they've been abused. Usually they'll deny it, but uh, you'll pick up on it and eventually they may uh, confide in you. So there are certain factors that make it possible for them to understand reality, and that is when they've been abused, they don't understand reality. Their reality is the reality of abuse, and they think that's just the way human beings act, and so they act out sexually all the time, and therefore they develop a tremendous defense mechanism or a defense system of reaction to anything that they don't agree with in terms of self-righteousness. That is when they become older. And uh, the uh, child, the person who has been abused sexually, especially, there's different kinds of abuse as we've studied, but the sexual abuse is prominent and causes many, many problems they develop a tremendous defense system, a defense mechanism system. And even though they are lascivious themselves, 
and even though they might have multiple sexual partners, and even though they uh, constantly think about sex themselves, they uh, move into self-righteousness. And they justify what they're doing. And if anyone crosses them in adult life, uh, they equate that person with the abuser, and they're really maladjusted to life. And that's why there's so much psychosis and neurosis today. And it all relates to child abuse, as this has been, become a culture almost of child abuse because we don't uh, handle harshly enough the child abuser. In fact, we let them go. In the Old Testament, if someone abused a child, they're executed immediately. If there's two or more witnesses, there was no appeal trial. They were executed. And if the witnesses said, yes, I saw it, yes, I heard this, I heard the child from her own lips or from his own lips say, yes, it happened, they were executed right then. And no thought about it. But today they might go through a rehabilitation center and uh, these people are not re they cannot be rehabilitated, especially by human viewpoint. They can be rehabilitated by post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation, but they cannot be rehabilitated by society in any way. And society should condemn it and destroy those people instead of allowing them to continue on the earth. But because they do, they usually get out and uh, abuse some other child. And it's uh, just uh, almost overlooked. So the child never has an ability as a child to resolve the issue of being abused. It's impossible. A child does not have the forward line of troops. A child does not have any ability to have all of the spiritual assets put into place to handle these things. So the child moves to defense mechanisms. And these defense mechanisms are very helpful when they are young children. But when they become adults, it becomes maladaptive because the defense mechanisms are related to arrogance. And one of the things I've read that's happened is a young lady has been abused, and during the abuse, in order to separate herself from it, she becomes part of a wall, and just imagines herself as part of the wall to separate herself from the incident. And that's a defense mechanism, and it works for them as children. It's a God-given system so that they don't have to deal with the trauma of the situation. But when they become adults, Becoming part of a wall when you have normal problems in life it doesn't help a thing. In fact, it uh, indicates you have moved into psychosis and therefore in, are in need of medication. So uh, there are, of course, as I've said, the, the parents are the greatest influence on the child. And some of the failures of the parents often uh, rubs off on the children. For example, if parents are constantly complaining, this attitude definitely rubs off on the children, and they too will constantly complain. And that's one of the lesser forms of uh, abuse. It's not that you couldn't call it abuse in which it would be prosecuted, but it's something that shouldn't happen. It does happen, uh, but it's one of the lesser forms. Now, if the greater form, such as sexual abuse, if you complain all the time and your children, as a result, complain all the time, well, that's understandable. So in the same way, if they've been sexually abused and they act out sexually, that's understandable. But usually what happens is all the blame falls on the child. And the child will be acting out sexually and you will say to them, that's nasty, don't do that. Or that is a shame on you. When you should be curious as to why are they doing that. Where have they learned this type of behavior? Now, sometimes it occurs uh, just simply growing up and uh, discovering and all that. But uh, if it's excessive, you should wonder. And you shouldn't say shame on you because they already feel guilty. That's a given. And then when you see it happen and say shame on you, then they feel extra guilty because not only have they been abused, but now the parents are frowning on them. And so they're probably not going to confide in you. But if you were to uh, approach it gently, and, and if you see something occurring, well, you could say something like, well, has anybody ever touched you like that, uh, etc. And then uh, they might confide in you. Also, oftentimes they don't because of the embarrassment factor, especially among young uh, men. They get very embarrassed about it. The ladies would be more able to confide in their mother. Usually uh, young men just aren't going to confide at all. But in certain cases, they do. So uh, children learn from their parents. And if their parents have abused them, uh, they learn that same thing of abuse. And they usually perpetuate it to their own children. So we've had generations of people perpetuating child abuse. 
uh, and they really don't know any better. They've never learned the spiritual skills. They've always used the skills related to the defense mechanisms. And so they don't, um, they don't see it as abnormal at all. It's just a normal function of life. They grew up in it, and they're going to do the same thing to their children. So after three generations, this is where we get the four-generation curse. After three generations of perpetuated child abuse, God then must discipline the nation. He lets it occur for, he doesn't let it, but he does permissively. He lets it occur for three generations to see if one of those generations might wake up to the plan of God and wake up to the grace of God. Usually it doesn't happen. And we in this nation are under the third generation curse, moving very quickly to the fourth generation curse. And when that occurs, uh, then God disciplines the nation. And I don't know how many of you watch the news, but if you've been watching it lately, it's very obvious we are under divine discipline as a nation. Now, it could turn around. As long as we're here as a nation, God has given us grace in which we can wake up to the importance of the Word of God. But child abuse is very rampant in this nation, extraordinarily rampant. And it would shock you to even uh, know how rampant it is. It's, it's a more than half, I can tell you that. And it's one-third for the sexual abuse, that's the estimate, but then you have emotional abuse and all of the rage and all of that, that uh, and drunkenness in which one of the members of the family is a drunk and gets angry with the children and beats them, and then uh, one or the other, and then there's drug abuse in which uh, the drug abuse causes them not to act right and abuse the children as well. And so these things definitely do have impact in terms of the national uh, health. So divine discipline definitely is on the horizon for this nation because child abuse is actually commonplace. I would venture to say it's way, well over 50%, even among Christian families. And it's, it's commonplace, yet it's not recognized because how are you going to recognize it when your family did it to you and then you do it to your family and then uh, it goes on and on generation to generation. There's just uh, it's a cycle that's very hard to break, and that's the point. And God breaks it through divine discipline, through divine judgment. Because if He let it go on for generation after generation, it would get so bad that uh, we would end up like the Israelites during Jeremiah's day, in which they would burn their, old cho their own children in a religious, religious ritual while having an orgy. And that's what they did in Jeremiah's day, and shortly thereafter they went on to the fifth cycle. And we haven't gone that far yet as a nation, so there's still hope, but we're heading in that direction very quickly. And I know that because every now and then, uh, when I get uh, some time around a television, I don't have cable now, but when I get time around a television and in the morning and Dr. Phil comes on, well, usually you see a mother and a child, usually a mother and her daughter. I saw one last week while my dad was having his eye surgery, and I had to sit there, and they had Dr. Phil on, and I about gagged, but I watched it anyway. And uh, the mother was all up, was always critical of herself in terms of how she looked and would uh, pull up her pants and have to lay on the bed because she bought pants that were too tight and then said, I look disgusting. Well, no wonder, but buy some bigger pants, you dummy. I mean, you're, you're, she wasn't really that fat either, and she wasn't that unattractive, but she had a big problem with uh, feeling unattractive. And then her daughter imitated her, and everything that her mother did, she did. And then Dr. Phil had some pretty good human viewpoint advice, but uh, they're not going to change their ways because of Dr. Phil. He just uh, handed out some uh, free things where she was going to go learn how to, I forget what she was going to learn how to do, but uh, it, it was all human viewpoint. It's not a true solution. It might be temporary. But the fact is, uh, here's, a, here's a parent not knowing how to live, not knowing how to function under the flat line of troops, and therefore, how is her child? If the parents are under stress, the ch the children learn that. Now, if the parent now parents always come under stress at some point and take it away from your child when that occurs, especially the stress between mother and father between marriage. Just take it away and uh, deal with it away from the children. They have no means of dealing with it, and they look at it as just a part of life, and therefore it's perpetuated generation after generation. But through cognition, inculcation, and metabolization of Bible doctrine, your past, including the past events of child abuse, can be drowned 
with the abuser. Remember what it said in uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. It says, um, it says there that uh, it would be better for him, the one guilty of child abuse, that a millstone turned by a donkey were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the deepest part of the sea. The application for the person who has been abused is this. If you have been growing up spiritually, if you have had cognition, inculcation, and metabolization of the Word of God in your soul, then you have to understand Matthew 18.6 and you have to understand that God, as it were, has already dumped that abuser in the deepest depths of the sea. And what that means is you too have to take that past experience of child abuse and drown it with the abuser. What I mean by that is even though law enforcement might not deal with that person, God will. And knowing that God will deal with that person, you have to say to yourself, that abuser is drowned. They're dead. And anything that they did to me is in the past, and God has given me a future. And that is the principle. And it requires many, many decisions. It's not easy, and it's not a one-shot decision, as I've just uh, uh, said in the fact that you drown them. You can try it, but you've got to know the mechanics behind it and how to do it. And it requires many decisions, not just one, because uh, if you've been abused, that person's constantly going to come back into your frame of reference, into your mind, and you're going to have to make many decisions regarding that person or persons to reverse all the problems that are created by child abuse. And what happens when you are abused as a child? It builds up garbage in your stream of consciousness. And that is because you have used the defense mechanisms. It's not your fault, by the way. It's how God designed it. And you uh, defended yourself against the abuse. For example, some children who have been sexually abused, when the abuser comes around, they wet their pants or they do number two in their pants in order to uh, fend off the abuser. It's a good way to do it, too, because you stink and they don't want to be associated with that and it, uh, uh, it cuts off their perverse sexual drive. And so that's a one defense mechanism that, that is used. And oftentimes, uh, I don't know why they don't recognize it more than they do, but when children start doing this in school around authority figures, they should uh, begin to wonder, what's, what's gone on here? And sometimes they do if they've been uh, trained in it, and most school officials have been. Uh, but that's one of the biggest ways to know that if the uh, child just defecates on himself or, or herself for uh, no reason when they've already been potty trained, of course, there's something wrong. There's something wrong mentally, not physically. There are some certain physiological problems uh, that could cause that to happen, but it's usually there's the difference is usually noted, and they do understand that, and oftentimes they do investigate it when that occurs, but it's not as well known as it should be. So the way that a child can get out of this when they become adults is only through Bible doctrine. And of course, medicine. We have wonderful medicine today that can stabilize the souls of those or stabilize all of the uh, post-traumatic stress disorder that occurs. It's traumatic to be abused. And therefore, sometimes medicine is absolutely necessary. And if they do not receive that medicine, uh, they use the def- defense mechanisms all their lives. And it's not a shame, and I've known some people that just will not take medicine because it's a sign that they think of it as a sign of weakness. It's not. If you need help and you take the medicine, look at it as a sign of strength. You know that you need it and therefore take it. Because otherwise, uh, it's very diff- it's difficult anyway when you've been abused to get with the Word of God because it brings out the things that are personal and uh, therefore it steps all over your toes. And if you haven't um gotten away from the defense mechanisms, you'll react to doctrine just as you've reacted to the child abuser and just as you react to anything else in life as if it were a child abuser and the whole world's against you, including the pastor, etc. But with medicine, you can uh, sometimes it helps you relax and you can sit down and not take it all personally. And I'm not saying anyone here is like that. I'm just talking in general. And I know there's some on the Internet that have been through some of these things. So the evil child abuser uh, should not have a decent burial, and that's what we get out of Matthew 18.6. 
Where should the child abuser be buried? In a sea with no marking, no grave, no decent burial. They should be buried in the sea. And that is exactly indicative of the tremendous amount of judgment God brings on the child abuser. The evil child abuser should not have a decent burial, but an unmarked grave. And that's the principle. Being thrown into the sea with a millstone around your neck means you have no grave. You're in the ocean being eaten by the fishes where you should be with no grave. And that means that uh, it wipes out the memory, the memory of those uh, child abusers. Now, I know fishes is not a plural. A fish is plural. <laughs> I was just being silly. So, um, child abuse should never be recognized in any way by society. And that's what this is saying. Don't, uh, don't accept it, society. Don't accept it, laws of the United States of America. Bury those people in the sea. Execute them and throw them in a pauper's grave with no uh, grave marking or anything. A, a disgraced death, in other words. And the fact is, some people are just too evil to live. Child abusers is one category. Too evil to live. Now, uh, God in His grace does grant the child abuser every possible um, opportunity to believe in Christ. Most of the times, they never do. So even the memory of such a person, this is what we get out of Matthew 18.6, when you throw them into the sea, when God throws them into the sea, it means that for you as an abused person, not even the memory of such a person, uh, person should come into your frame of reference. It should be removed forever by the problem-solving devices, by growing in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And part of this is why Philippians 3.13 says, We are to forget those things which are behind. And this is especially important for those who have been abused as children. Forget it. Now, you're not going to forget it. Remember, the corrected translation is disregard. That's why the, the book, the, the pamphlet that I uh, wrote said dis, disregard it. Name it and disregard it. You're not going to forget it when you screw up unless you uh, get some disease like Alzheimer's. And you're not going to forget the child abuse, but you should disregard it. So disregard those things which are behind, including child abuse. However, if you do not disregard it, you're going to continue to use the childhood defense mechanisms. And this is where we get a, a listing of some of those defense mechanisms. What are the childhood defense mechanisms? Well, when a child is abused, oftentimes they use a technique called denial. They deny it happened. And when they deny it, eventually they forget it. They really do forget it. And that is... And that has to do with the fact of a defense mechanism. The event is so traumatic. If you've been abused, especially sexually, by a father or a mother or a brother or a sister, it's so traumatic that you go into denial that it even happened. And in fact, when that occurs, you go into the second form, which is repression. You repress it. And when you repress it, you completely forget it. And you might have always wondered uh, when you've watched television or watched some movie where somebody has completely forgotten about a traumatic event, especially when they're children, it does happen. They just repress it. They don't even remember it. And, uh, and oftentimes that's indicated, not always, but uh, sometimes, you know, most of us can remember when we were in first, second, third grade. But for the person who has been abused, if that abuse took place for those three years in first, second, and third grade, they don't remember anything about it. They don't remember their teachers' names. They barely even remember the name of the school they went to. Uh, they don't remember their friends. But for most normal people, they remember all that. I remember my first, second, and third grade teachers. Miss Fraley, Miss Freeman, and uh, Miss Pack. And I remember all those uh, ladies. Two of them were good. Well, two of them were good teachers. One was terrible. One had obviously been abused herself. Uh, and I'll tell you this. I won't tell you who it was. But uh, she would come into class and eat chocolate and break out into hives. She knew that she could not eat chocolate. And she would eat chocolate, break out into hives, and then say, and then look at all the students, us uh, uh, in second grade, looking at the students and say, why did you let me eat that chocolate? As if we had any choice. Well, that's an indication of uh, somebody living under delusion. 
Maybe she was just crazy, but that she was crazy. I know that much. That woman was out of her mind. And she made a bunch of two uh, second graders feel guilty. All of them just felt tremendously guilty because we let her eat chocolate as if we could have ran up and jerked it out of her mouth. And we were under her authority. And uh, a lot of this occurs with mentally deranged people, often because of uh, child abuse. And repression is part of it, meaning you completely forget it. And then the, there's another form called projection. And projection is when, uh, this comes out later when you're an adult, and you project all your faults onto someone else. And some people, uh, some people have been known to go out and party and commit all different types of fornication and drunkenness and all sorts of things, and then uh, forget about it the next day and project it onto someone else and say, that lady over there is a slut, she did this and this and this. And it's all part of projection, that woman might be, uh, be a, a Sunday school teacher. A good one. And so, uh, there is, uh, it's really weird, the things that happen, and the uh, actual, for they forget it all, and when they carry it into adulthood, sometimes they even forget their adulthood uh, decisions. All part of repression. And uh, you could say to them, uh, remember you went out last night and went all crazy? And say, I don't, I don't remember that. Now, sometimes it's because they were drunk, and that's different, but in some cases it deals with uh, this fact of repression. And I've, I've studied, I studied all this in college, and uh, also it, it does bring itself out in the Word of God as well when we get to certain words like disukos, which means double-minded. So as an adult, if you're functioning under these childhood defense mechanisms, it becomes impossible for you to execute the protocol plan of God. Impossible. If you're functioning under repression, denial, and projection, and no matter how long you sit in church, uh, if you're suffering from denial, repression, projection, if I had the energy and you had the energy to sit here for six hours a day, I could teach it six hours a day and you wouldn't get anything out of it. Not a thing. Because you are functioning under the defense mechanisms. You won't understand it. Uh, you might pick up on the vocabulary, but you won't understand how to apply it to your own life or anything like that, until you really get cemented in your mind, rebound. And what I mean by that, you could know rebound, but if you're constantly in denial of your wrongdoing, as the person is who has been abused using the child defense mechanisms, if you constantly say, I'm always right, I'm not wrong, if you constantly say, I did not do that in denial, and if you uh, go into projection and say that other person does that and I do not do that, you're never going to name your sins and you're going to be functioning under arrogance. God the Holy Spirit is your mentor, is not going to be able to convert gnosis into epinosis, and you're going to be dead in the water no matter how long you listen. And that is what occurs with many, many people. And often you say, well, what's the solution then? Well, uh, the solution is humility, but how do you get humble when you have all of this garbage in your stream of consciousness? One way is uh, there's medicine that helps you relax, medicine that helps, uh, that puts these things into line, and psychi psychiatry has gone a long way to help people with certain uh, things such as this, they might have an antidepressant. And antidepressants aren't just for people who are depressed, but oftentimes it overcomes some of these handicaps that have been developed. And uh, in fact, uh, some people take antidepressants for migraine headaches. There are certain physiological reasons for it, and migraine headaches, are orig they originate in the brain. It's something totally outside of the uh, muscles in the head, really, except that the brain does something to the muscles and constricts the flow of blood, and then the brain uh, has a reaction to that, and you have a severe headache and vomit and all of that. And sometimes antidepressants take care of that. And there's a lot of good things that come out of it. If you don't need it, of course, don't take it. But if you need it, take it. And this is one of the ways you can become stabilized enough to listen and to be objective enough to say to yourself, yes, I've been wrong in that area. And God gives us a way out always, always. And even though it's difficult, very difficult for any abused child, sometimes that abused child has been so traumatized that when they finally get the answer to it all, they latch on to it 
and never let go and listen their whole lives to the Word of God to stabilize themselves. And it works. I've seen it happen. I've known it happen. I've, I've uh, heard letters read by people who have had it happen to them and how doctrine completely changed their lives. And even their psychiatrists have written in to my uh, pastor, who is, of course, uh, not able to speak now, but my pastor in the past would write him and say, whatever you've been doing with my patient, you keep it up because they are a miraculous recovery. And usually, uh, psychiatrists never deal with recovery. They just, uh, they're able to give enough medicine to keep the person stable so that they can function at least okay in life without being nutcases. So the evil child abuser, as it says, should not have a decent burial, but an unmarked grave. And the reason for this is because that person should be erased from the earth. The child abuser should be erased from the earth so that there is no reminder of that child abuser. And the problem with our society is that by letting these child abusers hang around either in jail or then to get out of jail and perpetuate the same offense again, the problem with that is the abused person, if they ever come into contact with uh, that uh, abuser, a flood of memories comes back. They start to have flashbacks and uh, it's as if they've been raped or sodomized or abused or brutalized all over again just by one encounter with that person. That's why they should be buried in a sea, as our Lord says. And our society doesn't do it through law, but God the Father will do it in His own timing. And that is why so many child abusers die prematurely. God simply takes them out of the world. And I've, I've, know, I've known this in uh, knowing a certain people in my own life where God has just taken them out. Just poof, gone. At an early age when they were otherwise very healthy. So even the memory of such a person should be removed. And that's where we get the principle of Philippians 3.13 that we are to disregard those things that are behind. Now, when you are abused, you definitely create a g garbage in your soul. And it's not your fault. It's part of the defense mechanisms. But when you use them and you pull them into adulthood, you, what you do is you pull bitterness into your life. And through projection and denial, you begin to blame all other people for your problems. And you begin to complain about everything in your life. You become vindictive. You want to destroy everybody. Everybody to you is against you and they are an abuser. And that's why so many people run around today and say the whole world's against me. The whole world doesn't, isn't against you and most people don't even think about you. But the abused person thinks that everyone is thinking about them and wants to destroy their lives. And uh, that's part of building up bitterness. It's part of building up uh, vindictiveness. It's part of a, it's actually the motivation of guilt in your soul. You feel so guilty about what has happened, even though it's not your fault, but it's inevitable. You feel so guilty about what's happened, you're motivated to be angry in life. And because of all of these emotional sins, because of anger, because of guilt, because of bitterness, because of all of these things, you'll never be able to execute the protocol plan of God for your life unless you get rid of those things, unless you bury bitterness, unless you bury vindictiveness, unless you bury the guilt in the sea with the child abuser. And that is how you, you have to disregard those things that are behind. Difficult to do. It's a daily decision, if not an hourly decision, or a minute-by-minute -minute decision for the abused person. But it's important that every time the thought of that wretched person who abused you pops into your mind, bury him in the sea. Whether If you have to do it a hundred times a day, uh, imagine them being buried in the sea by God because that's exactly what God does to them. And that's exactly what you should do to them in your mind. Not that you are burying them, but that God is doing it for you and that you must move on with your life. No one ever gets ahead by dwelling on the past. And you can never use the past as an excuse for the way you act. And sometimes it has a tremendous amount of influence, but when you have all the assets that God has given to each one of us, 
There's no way to blame our past. Definitely no reason to blame genetics. And a person is not homosexual because they were born homosexual. It was a learned behavior. And usually homosexuals or lesbians, it was a learned behavior because of abuse. And uh, a lot of... Uh, I saw a story, I think Lifetime. And I think it's uh, movies for women, but I like them. Some of them are dealing w a lot with uh, uh, just human experience in life. And a lot of those shows are very interesting. And one young man had been stolen from his own parents by a pedophile, and he had been abused his whole life. And uh, what happened to him is uh, Well, he was around a man who abused him all the time. This man smoked and drank all the time, too. He was just a, a, a terrible character, not that smoking and drinking has anything to do with it, but that he was an abusive person. And so uh, when the uh, young man was growing up, uh, the, the uh, abuser would bring in a prostitute and uh, make the uh, young man have sex with the prostitute as well. And uh, the young man learned to smoke at an early age, and he learned to get drunk at an early age, and we're talking preteen, and have sex with prostitutes. That was his lifestyle for about uh, eight years following that. And then he finally, uh, they caught up with this man, and this man ended up dying in jail, and, and so he had to go to an orphan home. But uh, the authorities put him in the worst home possible. They put him in, a, they said Christian home. It was a legalistic home. And so he had grown up under all this abuse and he was addicted to cigarettes by now, addicted to alcohol. So he would go out and uh, drink beer out on outside and smoke a cigarette. And when the, uh, the, the, his new parents would catch him, they'd make him feel guilty for it. That's not the way to do with somebody like that. What he needed was the gospel. And uh, his behavior change would come with his growth and in, in, in growing in grace and in knowledge. But they were treat they just made him feel as, as if he didn't already feel guilty enough. They loaded guilt upon guilt because uh, now they looked down on him because of the, the fact that he smoked and drank. Well, think about what the man went through or the young man went through. And it was a, it was a show that really shows the stupidity of many, many Christians. Because they, they focus so much on the behavior change instead of a soul change. And the behavior change comes along eventually. But what must come first is the change in the soul. And to make somebody feel guilty when they already feel guilty, you're adding insult to injury. And that's exactly what this family did. It was quite an amazing show. I forget the name of it. But also, I'll be, uh, I'm going to look for, maybe tonight, I'm going to look for that book if I don't have it here, uh, that uh, book of a, a man called it or something, a child called it. And I'll read some passages out of that concerning what he went through. And uh, I know my wife read it, and she would just burst out in tears all of a sudden and while I'm laying in bed. I said, what in the world wrong with you? It was the book. And then she would read me part of it, and it's just terrible. The certain things that have happened to children. This man made it. Uh, and I think he made it even though he was an unbeliever, but he made it because of divine establishment. And uh, he even met with President Reagan and all of those uh, famous people. And I think he's wealthy today. So, uh, but inevitably, you use these defense mechanisms. And what you have to understand is that uh, while therapy, therapists tell you to dwell on the past, is that you can't change the past. Oh, they might bring out of repression some things that have happened to you, but so what? You can't change it. If you've been abused sexually or otherwise, you can't change that. So why feel guilty about it? You did nothing to receive it, and you, you can do nothing to change what happened. So you can't change the past, but you're still alive. And when you're breathing, that means God has a purpose for your life, no matter what you've went through or no matter what you've done even. Even for the abuser, if he's still breathing, God has a purpose for him to believe in Christ and to grow in grace. And for the person who has been abused, you're still alive and God has a purpose for you. And what you should do, as Scripture tells us to do, is to sprint forward. Don't uh, dwell on the past. It does nothing for you. And the only thing it does is destroys you. And don't dwell on the past. Move forward. And that's a principle that applies not only for the child abused person, but for all of us. 
We've all made mistakes in the past. Why dwell on it? We've all committed sins in the past that have shocked us and we've said, I never thought I would ever do anything like that. And then uh, we get shocked by our own decision. Well, guess what? Forget about it. Move on. Disregard it. Grow in grace and in knowledge. That's part of using the problem-solving devices. And the problem-solving devices in your soul are the solution to the defense mechanisms. It's actually antithetical or opposite of the defense mechanisms. You've learned to use the defense mechanisms all your life because of child abuse or because of something else. Well, now it's time to learn a different system provided by God called the problem-solving devices, the flat line. The defense mechanisms hide the problem. They repress it. They deny it. They project it on others. The problem-solving devices deal with the problem and put it in the past. Defense mechanisms bring the past into the future and then you deny it or project it on someone else or blame someone else. And there might be a lot of blame that needs to go around, especially for the child abuser. But remember, God's buried him in the sea, so you do the same. That's the principle. So the child abuser should end up far out to sea with a giant millstone tied around his neck. Therefore, when the problem-solving devices take over your soul through learning the Word of God, your past, including your child abuse, is over the horizon. When you look out at the sea, if you go to Myrtle Beach or Daytona Beach or anywhere, there's a horizon there. And that person has been buried in the sea beyond that horizon. In other words, you can't see them anymore. They're gone. And that is your mental attitude, or it should be. And that means forget about it disregard it, all of that is in the depths of the sea, it's in the past. But if you dwell on it, this is what happens. Garbage in the soul occurs from dwelling on the past events. And when you do that, it hinders, it frustrates, and it even destroys the spiritual life, at least for the moment and at the present. Garbage in the soul from dwelling on past hinders or hindrances, uh, past uh, things that have caused you to be frustrated, destroys the spiritual life at the present. And regardless of how bad the childhood environment has been, if you dwell on it when you're an adult, it will cause you to be, as an adult believer, occupied with self. It means you will accumulate more garbage in your stream of consciousness. And therefore, you'll be preoccupied with yourself, And this is an arrogant preoccupation, and it will exclude reality, and you will continue to adopt that which was used in childhood, which is the defense mechanisms, instead of using the problem-solving devices and putting them on the flat line of the soul. Now, I know some of this is rather deep, especially for you uh, younger people, but... uh, I'm going to do something on the internet, not live. I'll pre- It'll be a, a, a more basic type thing if you're interested. Uh, there's been interest on the web, especially for the teen things that I've done, and they've actually received more hits than anything else. So I'll probably do it at home, and uh, it'll be on there for anybody who wants to uh, get it. And if you have trouble getting on the internet, CDs will be made eventually. Uh, but there's interest on the web, so I'm just going to do it at home. And uh, since we're all so busy uh, nowadays with school and everything, then you can do it at your own leisurely time whenever you feel like it. And so I'll just do this uh, part of it at home. And that and that'll get you uh, back with the, some of the basic things that you've been grabbing onto. I know for some of you this is just. Uh, over the head, I guess, maybe, probably. And you might be picking up on it, and that would be wonderful, too. I'm not here insulting you. I'm just saying I understand that when I was a teenager, I wouldn't have understood any of, of the, these terms, and it would be boring to me. So I do have, I feel sorry for you. Uh, I'm not angry. I just, uh, I understand it. This is, this is actually, this, we're moving into advanced things here. And when we deal with child abuse, uh, we have to deal with it in these terms so that, uh, If anyone's been exposed to it, they know how to get out of it. And there is a way, there's always a grace way given to us by God to get through the worst of situations. And uh, if you do not follow God's plan, no matter what you've been through, no matter what type of child abuse, no matter how horrible your past has been, uh, it's not an excuse. It's not an excuse whatsoever. And we must learn that God has provided a solution 
And that once we start to understand God's love, and we understand that even though we went through all of those horrible things, there was a purpose for it. And God knew what family you would be born into. God knew if you would be abused. God knew, and God knew everything about you in eternity past. And despite your failures, and despite the failures of the abuser, God's love sent Jesus Christ to the cross anyway. And He went there anyway. And that means this love, this tremendous divine love, over, overcomes all. And the only thing you have to do is learn about it and grow in grace and in knowledge. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank You for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May we come to understand Your grace and all of these things that we study regarding child abuse in order that we come to understand that even in the most dire of circumstances, You have given us the most phenomenal of solutions and that we no longer have to blame ourselves or blame others, but we can latch on to the problem-solving devices which give us the answer. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.